listen. So as a part of our Monday live streams back in June, we did a fundraiser taking your movie request to be compiled for a Jumbo LME. And I got a bunch of good ones from a lot of people who donated. Shout out to everyone who donated and just sent a message saying hi, but maybe this will add some more interesting movies to your guys' queue as well. I also compiled a list of the movies we talked about on the live stream as a little must-watch list with my top three easily being the South By documentary Stranger Fruit. If you haven't seen that one, I highly recommend it. There's also the series Random Acts of Flyness on HBO, which I think is completely underrated. And one of my favorite movies of its year, The Sundance Selected Monsters and Men over on Hulu. Fantastic. I got that whole list linked down below and over on Letterboxd. And this list of your recommendations in alphabetical order, all time stamped in the description. So let me explain. <laughs> So 7500 is the first film Joseph Gordon-Levy's done since like 2016, if you don't count his voiceover work. What's funny is I remember another plain movie called 7500 that I got way back in the day, but that one was like more supernatural. This one is way more grounded and it's actually based off the emergency code 7500, which stands for unlawful interference. It's a directorial debut of Patrick Bolrath, who approaches this movie in a very realistic way where the entire terrorist attack is from the perspective of the cockpit. If you're a fan of battle films and want to see Joseph give his Captain Phillips performance, I'd say check it out on Amazon. It's a very tense, emotion-driven movie. Uh, but if you wanted a taste of the director's work, he does have a short film, Everything Will Be Okay, out on YouTube, covering a father who takes his daughter for the weekend, but then tries to fly away with her. It showcases his humanistic approach, and it even got him an Oscar nom out of it. Another one I was recommended was Agora, which is a historical drama by Alejandro Amenabar, who did one of my favorite movies, which is also getting a little modern remake. This one follows Rachel Wise as the Greek philosopher Hypatia from the 4th century. As science and superstition are clashing with each other, you got the pagans and the Christians arguing, one side trying to take down the statues while the other one wants to burn down the library. And Agora here actually stands for the public spaces where they're gathered, which would be that library that her father owns. And I really, really like this movie. In my research, I noticed that on its release, there was a lot of pushback from religious leaders who went at it for historical inaccuracies, but they like also just didn't want to believe that any religious leaders could do anything wrong. I think it does do a great job at pitting different ideologies against each other, but also not demonizing them. You know, it's just showing the faults when it comes to reasoning and seeing the bigger picture of what there is still to discover about this earth. And it even starts an early Oscar Isaac, so I would highly recommend it. And you offend us. You should move out to the desert. You won't hear anything to offend you out there. Arkansas stars Liam Hemsworth as a drug dealer alongside Clark Duke, who you may know from The Office or Hot Tub Time Machine, and he actually directed this movie. In it, they swap out construction workers for park rangers as they get involved with Vince Vaughn and Vivica A. Fox, and it's kind of told in chapters, with two of them being flashbacks, which I found to be the more entertaining ones. I think this one's going to do really well once it's on streaming. It's even got the Flaming Lips as composers. Stars Eden Brolin, daughter of Thanos, but it definitely needed more Michael K. Williams. Would either of you boys like to call on me, sir. You can if you want. We're gonna go traffic drugs across state lines, sir. As Above, So Below is a horror movie that follows an archaeologist who goes down into the Paris catacombs to find Flamel's Philosopher's Stone, which can turn things into gold and give you immortality, but really they're just entering hell. What I found interesting in my rewatch of this was that I know that they actually shot in the real catacombs under Paris, and they got permission to film what they saw as their found footage Indiana Jones. They even did press junkets down there. The title is As Above, So, so Below. Mm -hmm. What? It's linked to alchemy. Um, and the motto, as above, so below, is all kind of the mantra of of alchemy, um, and it kind of explains their thinking of the world. Now, I am a found footage fan, so I didn't mind the aesthetic, uh, especially since they shot down there, but I get why people need a bag and a ginger ale after watching this. Uh, all the religious iconography is interesting, especially the, the play on Dante's Inferno, and how the only way to get back above is to go deeper and deeper. And in the end, it ends up being less about the stone that they're looking for, and more so them confronting their demons, and the guilt that keeps them trapped while they're above. For Scarlet, it's her guilt of not being there for her father's death. For George, it's not being able to save his brother from drowning. And ironically, it's them entering this hell that leads them to their rebirth. Balls out. Falls Out is a comedy that premiered at Tribeca, originally titled Intramural, which is a much better title, and it follows fifth-year seniors who play football in their own league with their own commentators until one of them gets paralyzed. Jake Lacey plays the lead who's left his childish ways behind until he gets proposed to, and then he decides that he wants to get the boys back together. I think Beck Bennett is the funniest one in this movie, and if you haven't caught his short right here, I highly recommend it. It's a very similar type of humor, uh, but you just gotta love a good callback to the room. You still play? 
No. It's going to be my masterpiece. Bliss is a body horror over on Shudder from the same guy who did VFW the same year. It stars Doris Madison Burge, who I know from Friday Night Lights, and she's playing a struggling artist here who tries a new drug in order to get inspiration. And like ends up becoming kind of like a vampire. The director wrote it in a period where he was also broke, anxious, he had writer's block. How he fired his agents while writing it, which is why that dude comes off as such an asshole in the movie. Doris even wore his own clothes that she raided from his closet for the movie, so you can tell that while it's an absolutely insane movie, it definitely has a personal tone to it. It's very much a movie about calling out rich people and those who exploit artists who give their all for their work just for someone else to profit off of it. I don't know why it took so goddamn long. You said that you wouldn't be caught dead painting a that cover for a room full of suits, remember? It's one that's super gory, at times way over the top, but the dude bought his own 16mm camera just to shoot it, and he sticks to his style. It may not be for everyone, but I think for fans of Climax, which I know I need to revisit as well, it takes you down an indie budget trip of the creative process in the goriest way possible. Blood Quantum is another Shudder film that premiered at TIFF, directed by Jeff Barnaby. Pretty much there's a zombie outbreak, but the twist is, is that indigenous people are immune and everyone else ain't. And now unlike history where colonization brought diseases over here, wiping them out, they have to decide how to survive the second apocalypse. I think it's a decent genre flick, but where it's really strong is in its themes, which I found more intriguing, you know? It's kind of like It Comes at Night, but more action-based for people who <laughs> were expecting other things out of that movie. The title derives from actual laws in America that stripped indigenous people of their rights by determining how native they were based off their blood. Obviously, it's a very controversial topic and there's a lot more people who can uh, give you a better view of it, but it's just crazy to think that years later, it, when they passed reparation laws, they then wanted to flip it and looked at it as a positive in order for you to like get paid for the places that were taken away from them. So the movie excels at flipping that and talking about borders, you know, tribal lineage and how in America, any virus is going to make us go crazy. Clearly. I think the great thing about cinema is that you can present those grand ideas in a non-violent way. Well, <laughs> non-violent. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody died in the making of this film. Burning Cane comes from Philip Human, a 19-year-old director who also wrote it and shot it and became the youngest filmmaker to win a Tribeca. The story takes place in Louisiana and follows a mother trying to help her son and pastor who are dealing with alcoholism. And the thing about this movie is this dude is dissecting religion and the cycles of control that come from it at 19? He's talking about faith and how something that can set you free can also bind you. The idea of what's forbidden fruit, you know, what's taboo and who gets to decide that, who's interpreting scriptures. Uh, and it's also produced by Ben Zeitlin, who did Beasts of the Southern Wild. And he's been pushing some really intriguing projects that I would also recommend if you're interested in some fresh independent movies. And this would be one of them as well. Carmen Joes is Otto Priminger's 1954 adaptation of the musical set in World War II. It follows Carmen Jones, a parachute maker who falls for Corporal Joe, who's meant to get married to Cindy Lou before going on a trip with Carmen, and all of their plans go out the window. It's a very seductive movie for its time, and the MPAA hated it because they didn't like the decisions Carmen makes in the movie. What's even crazier is that it was a battle for Otto to finance this movie because he knew studios wouldn't want to fund an all-black cast, so he was he was ready to fund it himself. He was even gonna buy out his own contract from Fox before you know they started thinking in the 21st century and decided to help him. I think that the CinemaScope still holds the test of time, especially with its restoration. The, the music is great. It's been preserved in the Library of Congress. Dorothy Dandridge became the first black actress to get a leading nomination for this movie, uh, but it would be interesting to see a modern adaptation of this, especially because of the paradox that it has in its ending. But in any case, uh, it's always good to go back. And I've been on my Belafonte binge, and this dude is an absolute legend. I handed her the coconut. It was my rebellion to the idea that we couldn't kiss, to find a way to do it as sexually and as seductively as I possibly could. And by drinking from that, it kind of sent the message through the lens that uh, we were having an orgasm. I Am the Pretty Thing That Lives in the House is a gothic horror film that premiered at TIFF and is also available on Netflix. It follows a hospice nurse who moves into a farmhouse in order to take care of an author with the whole thing being a retelling from her perspective. It's directed by Oz Perkins, who I think does a very effective job at creating a horror atmosphere, even though I wouldn't say it's it's scary, if that makes any sense, you know? It's more like a poetic tale about ghosts. It takes a lot of inspiration from Shirley Jackson, which definitely go check out Shirley if you haven't. It plays with a lot of the same themes that his other movies have, such as confinement, 
influence, be it from external factors like the ghost of Polly or internally, like we see with Lily, who's decided to go out into the country. I remember when the movie first came out and Ruth Wilson talked about the patriarchy and how that had to do with the movie and people like hated that interpretation and told her to shut up, which one, ain't she the actress in the movie too? That's kind of the title. And Oz would even go on to do Gretel and Hansel. That continues those themes straight out. And really it's the whole system that's so absurd. It's had to sleep with crop to some bishop and we're not even permitted to feed her. Again, I love how he visually composes his movies. I think they're super creepy, even if I don't think they're the strongest screenplays or they're very heavy on exposition. But if I had to pick his best, I would recommend Black Coat's Daughter, which is also on Netflix. I'm No Longer Here is a Mexican drama that premiered at Tribeca this year, and it is absolutely fantastic. We follow a team named Ulysses whose story jumps back and forth from his time in Mexico to his time in New York where he's trying to fit in. And back home, him and his group of friends just hang out. You know, they dance to cumbia and they stand out with their, their hair and their outfits. But once they're getting older, the real gang leaders want to recruit him and he has to make a choice to either stay or leave. I talked about this more on Intercut and I'm definitely going to be mentioning more throughout the years since it's one of my favorites. I think it's beautifully shot. It's a subtle yet powerful performance by Juan Daniel Garcia Trevino and it's got one of the best scenes of the year that almost put me to tears. And it's on Netflix. The Killing of a Sacred Deer is my least favorite Yorgos film, but it's easily the one I get requested the most. It's not that I hate it. I just hate how uneasy it makes me feel. Time's getting on, and if I'm late for class, I'm done for. <laughs> it follows a surgeon who starts getting stalked by the son of a patient who died on his operating table and realizes slowly that Martin is there to balance things out. I think Barry Keough is a fantastic actor, and I have stock in him growing to be one of the greats. That said, I hated him in this movie. You know, and then he bumped his head in Dunkirk and I fell for him again. The movie is designed to be like a Rorschach test with everyone even in the cast interpreting it in different ways. Uh, but revisiting it, the hierarchy in the hospital system really stood out because they had this whole idea that they play with that surgeons are like gods who hold life and death in their hands but can shift blame just due to their status in society. A surgeon never kills a patient. An anesthesiologist can kill a patient, but a surgeon never can. It's obviously a parable of balance, as the Greek title references, how one wrong must be amended by an innocent sacrifice, or else, you know, the sins of the father will plague his children. One day, I do want to go back and revisit all of Yorgo's films, mainly so I have a reason to talk more in depth about Dogtooth. But in the meantime, I highly recommend Essential Films' breakdown on this movie, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, but to me, I think Colin put it best, interpreting it as humans being just one event away from tragedy. Me and Earl the Dying Girl was one of my favorite films from that year, and it even won two big awards at Sundance. It follows Greg and Earl, who see each other as acquaintances, since Greg has a fear of getting too close to people until he's forced by his parents to hang out with Rachel, who's been diagnosed with leukemia. It's beautifully shot. There's a great breakdown on the cinematography that I'll link right here that breaks down how the camera follows the mindset of Greg throughout, and how he maneuvers, and how he starts changing the way he sees the world. I love the creativity behind the stop motion transitions, especially how it plays into the character's love for film, and a lot of that comes from the director having worked under, Inaritu, Scorsese, just a bunch of legends. He even has a one-on-one -on -one with Martin talking about his outlook on film preservation and film history, which you know, Scorsese is massive on, and how incorporating it into what most would consider a teen coming-of-age film keeps it in the spotlight. And having caught a lot of the real versions of the films that he's parodying since I first saw this movie, it, it is way funnier this new time around. And also, because you turned me on to film history as a kid, this was a way to continue that tradition by talking about movies that a younger generation could go out and find that weren't necessarily the popular ones. Memento is the reason Nolan is Nolan. Like, I remember binging every new release at my local Blockbuster, and the clerk up at the front started recommending me some of the five-day rentals instead, and he told me about this story about a guy with short-term memory who's trying to solve the murder of his wife but the whole thing is told in reverse. I personally think it's one of Nolan's best. Uh, it's top two for me. And as I was going back, uh, leading up to his works uh, for Tenet, you notice his fascination with time and how he, he's manipulating it throughout all of his films and how withholding or planting certain information from the audience can put you in the character's shoes. And I still think this is the epitome of that early on in his career. Rewatching it, I really liked how he played with the flashbacks, especially with how they were shot. He has the color sequences being done in first person, so we're kind of in his mind, while the black and white sequences are meant to sound like interviews, so they're more objective. And then the further you progress into the movie, they start to intertwine and it creates a masterpiece. I know everyone's waiting for that Inception sequel, but no matter how long Tenet may have been delayed, the best Nolan flicks are still out there, 
and are always worth the rewatches. This subjective view and this objective view and effectively having them meet at the end so that what we achieve is still subjective but with enough objective information built into it that we start to question the point of view that we've been given for the whole film. So that's about it. Nobody Knows I'm Here is a Chilean film that premiered at Tribeca and the first one Netflix has picked up. It stars George Huel Reyes as Memo, who as a kid wowed producers with his voice, but the producers decided to Milli Vanilli him so they could market a cuter face, so they just ghosted him. Ironically, the song that makes the artist popular is titled Nobody Knows I'm Here, and it's partly why Memo grows up to be a hermit living on an island with his uncle until his past comes back to shake things up. I think it's beautifully shot. It's a little slow, but it's an intimate character study and Marta and Memo are one of the cutest duos from this year. Scooby-Doo, the mystery begins. Now, I had binged pretty much every Scooby-Doo movie when I made the Scoops video a couple months ago, and I found out this one was actually supposed to be the third in the live-action installments, even meant to be a prequel for how they met. Scooby-Doo, where are you? It starts Haley Kiyoko as Velma, Robbie Amell as Fred, actually knowing how to throw a football, as the gang meets in detention and right after get attacked by ghosts, causing them to come together and solve the mystery. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to inform you that you no longer have detentions. Oh, oh now you're all suspended. It doesn't have near the budget that the first two had, obviously, but it does have an interesting twist ending. It also comes from the same guy who directed the live action Flintstones and Are We There Yet? And they even got a lot of voice actors to come in and play a role, including Frank Welker continuing the voice of Scooby as he took a break from Megatron. I come to a convention and people really want to hear G1. So I do Megatron. I am Megatron, leader of the Decepticons. This one went direct to TV and played on the Cartoon Network, but uh, it, it ended up breaking a viewership record, causing them to greenlit a fourth one. And without a doubt, if they ever make a fifth one, they gotta bring it back to the present times, and they gotta bring Matt Lillard back as Shaggy. So if you take your voice and go from the base of your voice to the falsetto, oh, there's that little crack. Like that's where that's where it lives. My voice is screwed up right now, so boy, dude. Sella and the Spades premiered at Sundance, and it's the directorial debut by Tarisha Poe. It follows Sella, who runs the biggest faction at a prestigious boarding school. And they're legit underground dons. Out of the five groups, you got some who are, you know, in charge of bootlegging alcohol into the parties, others who are just checking out security and, like, making sure the teachers don't find out. Some are just legit gambling. I, I know very little about boarding schools and how much freedom these kids have to run the school, but it turns out... It's really like this. Also just my experience of being at a boarding school when I was a teenager. I think it's a very particular way of growing up, particularly at that age. Um, and I wanted to try to communicate that and also just to express what having that amount of freedom at that period of time felt like. I had done a double feature with this and Looking for Alaska a while back, which also deals with a similar setting. And honestly, I think that book should have been a movie and this movie should have been a show. So I'm very glad to actually see that it is getting a series because you can tell that the whole world has been fleshed out and there's a system in place here, you know, there, that supersedes its 97 minutes. In terms of the story of Sella though, it is fascinating how she deals with power, you know. She's about to leave this organized system that she's at the top at only to go to college where she will have no say what Whatsoever, and I think that balance and the stuff that she's going through was really interesting. I know Rihanna's auntie inspired this, especially with the look. Mrs. Ebert was an executive producer, as well as Terrence Nance, who, again, super underrated show on HBO. And I'm excited to see what Teresha does next. And I think that it's important for us to recognize the power that we have over, over other people. And I think doing so, recognizing our own power over, over others, allows us to recognize more quickly when people have power over us. And once we recognize that somebody has power over us, we can begin to choose whether or not to allow that to happen. Small Soldiers. Small Soldiers was a recommendation that took me back. Yeah, I loved the making up for it growing up since, you know, it's about these sentient action figures trying to escape the corporate hands that be. So they really took the live action part seriously. It's directed by the same guy who did Gremlins and rewatching it. It's interesting to notice all the jokes that you're oblivious to as a kid growing up uh, while understanding that, you know, there were pressures from all the studios and the sponsors that they had to not have it go full Space Jam. In fact, there was even supposed to be a remake of this called Toy Toymageddon, but it was canceled when Disney bought Fox, so... That sucks. I used to watch this, Can of Worms, and James and the Giant Peach together all the time, so it was a nice little throwback that I really enjoyed.
If there's one movie that has had a growing cult following, it is Speed Racer. The Wachowski's adaptation of the 60s anime movie came out in 08 when everything was getting dark and gritty. So I know a lot of people had dismissed it when it first came out. I can't say I'm fully converted yet, but it wasn't as bad as people made it out to be. Zany? Yeah, hell yeah, but there are two things that really stood out to me on the rewatch. Uh, the first was embracing its wild editing. I had seen a lot of behind the scenes on how much they went into it, especially with the techniques to really push transitions, be it through flashbacks or, you know, a way to emphasize the emotions that the characters are going through while they're in action sequences. It's definitely jarring at first, but even the main storyline is pretty hefty, which, you know, it's the Wachowskis. Pretty much there's a massive company that's looking to expand their control over the racing world and speed mom and pop named mom and pops or trying to stay loyal to their mom and pop shop on top of that speed's brother who was also a racer literally because that's her last name passed so he's kind of continuing his legacy so while it's not my favorite wachowski film uh, revisiting it I, I can see why people resonate with the themes of family and how they're not really there to look down on you but to push you into becoming the best version of you can be as a collector in the show you know Speed is, he talks a thousand miles an hour because it was all dubbed from the, from the Japanese show. So he's like, I'm gonna win this race and I'm gonna, I'm gonna win it. And when I win this race, that's when I'll have won. He says the same thing. He's, he's really, you know, he says the same thing over and over again because they just had to fill up the space on the show for the, for the dialogue, to, for the translation. Our next movie is quite simply a masterpiece. Amen. This is the first movie to win the Oscar in the best animated feature category. I always forget that the English dub also has the same actress for Chihiro that voiced Lilo. And looking back at how Pixar played a major part of bringing Ghibli Ghibli, the best animation studio in the world overseas, over here, I started to even notice the Pixar Easter eggs that they put in there, like John Ratzenberger. <laughs> if you haven't experienced it, get on that HBO Max immediately, because I'm pretty sure they have all of them right now, uh, and it's well worth it. Pretty much, we follow a 10-year-old named Chihiro who's traveling to her new home when her parents stop at an abandoned amusement park, and then she gets spirited away. Originally, the biggest thing that stood out to me were the themes of uh, greed and pollution. Obviously, that it's a coming of age tale, but the older I've gotten and rewatching it recently, it's that concept of trust that really stood out. You know, that it's the most powerful weapon, and not only does it become a pivotal tool that Chihiro uses to navigate this world, but it's how Miyazaki navigates ours, becoming the master of animation that he is because of the respect that he gives his audience. And so I called over to Japan and talked to, to Miyazaki-san. I asked him, and he said, I think for American audiences to really understand the story of Spirited Away, I think they all need to learn Japanese. Legend. Man's retired more times than Brett Favre, and I still can't wait for his next movie. Princess Mononoke was supposed to be our last film, and now we have Spirited Away. Do you have more in the future? I try to make every film my last. <laughs> but some things are, remain beyond my will and control. <laughs> System Crasher is a German drama that follows a nine-year-old Benny who's considered a system crasher, a child who's considered too aggressive to be around others, and thus the system has no idea what to do with it. So making a film about the bad, bad system and the poor little child, I think it wouldn't be so interesting. It's much more real that the system wants to help, social workers usually want to help the children, it's not always possible. And Benny is a very extreme child, so it's not so easy to judge an adult who says, I can't deal with this child anymore. It won big at the German Film Awards, with it and Tony Erdmann being the only movies to ever score the big top five, and I think it's outstanding. The casting process went through over 150 actresses until they found Helena, and she kills the role. She is outstanding. She makes Jacob Tremblay look like a pure flicks child actor. And I like Jacob. In interviews, she's even talked about opening a hotel with like oily cakes just in case the acting thing doesn't work out. So I believe she's well ahead of her years. I think she's a genius, a master at her craft. It may be a tough watch, but I think it's worth it. And it's on Netflix in case you need to pause it. But Helena was better than half of the nominations last year. And that's a fact. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, I had this set as a movie Monday because obviously there was a lot of recommendations. uh, And just for me to be able to catch up on all the seasons of a show would be impossible. But I did get some really good suggestions. Eureka 7 is a fascinating show, and I'm happy it hopped on my radar. You follow a boy in the year 12,005 after humanity's gone through several changes. And he's specifically fascinated with this group known as Gecko State who surf up in the sky. And his family actually has made a lot of these machines that have been used for both good and evil. It's an extremely fleshed out world that pits different ideologies against each other, with Renton coming to the realization that even his idols aren't as clean as they may seem based off their own propaganda magazines. But there's also the environmental aspect, with humanity having left Earth and a terraform covering the planet that even has a mind of its own, how new religions and institutions have been created in this new world whose history isn't even our future yet, but puts you in the shoes of a kid who comes across all this knowledge and now has to act on it. Because once you know, you know. Love Life was another one that was recommended by a couple of people, and this one is over on HBO Max, which you know it isn't a streaming launch unless Anna Kendrick has something in there, and at least this one is much better than her Quibi one. So we find out that the doll's name is Barbara, and that she's a feminist. I have news for you, babe. We're all sex dolls until we topple the patriarchy. <laughs> It's great, you're a feminist sex doll. Yeah. It follows Darby Carter and 10 years of her love life, with each episode being meant to be a different relationship and how it shapes who she is. And Kendrick, who also produces, interjected a lot of her own personal stories in there, and I think that's what adds to the relatability of it, and definitely the awkwardness. I know it's meant to be an anthology series, so I'm curious where else they take it, as they cover new characters as Darby comes in and out. Schitt's Creek is the comedy that aged like fine wine and started getting awards Right as it right as it was ending, it follows an uber wealthy family who loses all of their money and end up running a town that they bought as a joke. It's created by Eugene Levy and his son Dan, and they've mentioned this being more of a family drama that just so happens to be pitched as a comedy. I've heard the later seasons get even better, so this has become a nice one uh, at the end of the day to wind down to to just catch an episode, and it's got some hits. See, Alexa seems to think you like me more. Alexis, don't be ridiculous. It's exactly the kind of paranoia that makes me wary of spending time with you. Now these next ones are some of my most recommended shows, so I'm gonna keep it short since these are definitely getting full LMEs in due time, like these never stop getting recommended. There's Mr. Robot, which I thought was a masterpiece after its first season, and it follows Rami Malek in his best performance as a computer programmer who's being used by major companies in absolutely every single aspect of this show, from its framing to its titles to the behind the scenes marketing is superb. It's created by Sam Esmail, who never misses, and I would even second adding Homecoming on your watch list if you haven't caught it. The Leftovers is another completed series that deals with the disappearance of over 140 million people, but it focuses on the leftovers and how they cope with it. It's based on the novel by Tom Perota and adapted by Damon Lindelof, who, I mean, Lost is my favorite show. So this is another one that, with quarantine, I can't wait to dedicate a week to and just, you know, rewatching it and dissecting it because it is fantastic. And ever since watching this, Yo, Carrie Coon is one of the greatest actresses of our generation, and she is completely underrated. Normal People is the Hulu show based on a book set in Ireland as we follow Marianne and Kano and their relationship as they go from high school to full-grown adults. And man, do people love this show. I haven't gotten far enough or, or read the book to form a full opinion on the characters, but it is interesting how the cinematographers called their visual approach wildlife-like and how they were peering into these two's lives as they grow up in a very very voyeuristic manner. I will have full LMEs on all of these, including, of course, because, like, this is not top five. This is not top three. This is the most recommended show we've gotten in the lifetime of this channel. It follows the step-by-step processes of this major heist, told through flashbacks and through each character involved in the heist. But the first rule of La Casa Papel is you don't talk about La Casa Papel. Just kidding. This thing became a phenomenon and got itself a, a documentary, you know, showing the trajectory of it. It caused a song from the 19th century to hit the charts. Some people have learned Spanish watching this bad boy, so I know I definitely have to do this one justice because, look, it, it does live up to the hype. So much so that they're supposedly already working on extra seasons, so we'll see. Thunder Road won the Grand Jury Award at South by Southwest, and it's the indie epitome of what film students want to make. Jim Cummings wrote, directed, stars, co-edited, composed, produced, did the visual effects. Literally, he was like one step away from being like Rodriguez and donating blood to fund his film. Then you watch the movie and realize he 
kinda did. It's the feature length adaptation of Coming Short, which would be the long take funeral scene that introduces the film. It follows a police officer who's lost his mother, is going through a divorce, a custody battle, and I think the making of the movie is very fascinating. He has a great interview with Behind the Curtain where he talks about ownership of your ideas and how to self produce your own stuff, and how it's really all about networking at the end of the day. You know, until it's not. It's as if Linklater made a UFO movie. I had seen The Vast of Night at the Chicago International Film Festival, and at first, you know, I thought it was okay, but I felt like it could have been a podcast, it didn't need to be a movie, and it turns out that that's kind of how the director wanted to play it. It takes place in 1950s New Mexico, where two friends investigate a strange frequency that keeps appearing, they then start interviewing others who have stories about this, but were ignored because they were either black or Latino, and it does a great job at rebuilding that period. They even cast a Texas town, which they completely took over and remodeled for the movie. They had the actors learn switchboards for the roles and i think the most interesting part was seeing kevin durant in the special thanks in the credits since the director himself had self-funded it with the commercials he did while he was at okc in, in order to keep kevin durant on the team in fact that's kind of how my camera crew came together for the vast of night and so if kevin durant had been 100 percent happy in oklahoma city my company <laughs> never would have gotten the job and then the budget for the vast of night might not have been what it is and so he has a very direct connection to why we're all sitting here tonight Finally, the last recommendation is for Wild Tales, which is the best film to end on because it's one of my personal favorites and I highly recommend it. It's an anthology of short stories that revolve around conflict. They had psychologists to help flesh out these characters and the scenarios that they're in to see how they would develop. That of a man whose car gets illegally towed and won't stop till he gets it back. A waitress serving the man who ended up killing her family, and it has the ultimate road rage short of all time. To me, this film is about the pleasure of losing control, the pleasure of reacting uh, towards uh, injustice, towards aggression. I personally love how the director in his interviews goes on several tangents, which I, I think you see in the movie as well. I think it's hilarious, and I, I think that's where some of the most interesting ideas and stories come from, and I love his view on genre, seeing comedy as being just as serious as drama, and that it can be just as emotional, but people tend to dismiss it because it's a joke, because it makes you laugh more. But man, if there was a movie that I've never stopped thinking about, it's Wild Tales, and I highly recommend it. Thank you guys for checking out this video. Of course, it was just a rundown of all the movies that I got. And if you donated it and I didn't cover, uh, make sure you hit me up on Twitter or Facebook. Send me your receipt and your recommendation because that's where I was compiling a bunch of them. Uh, but I'm curious to know your thoughts on any other movies that you would recommend. I will be trying to do another fundraiser LME live stream probably sometime in August, if not September, uh, to be able to get more of your recommendations. But man, I had a bunch and just try <laughs> trying to dissect most of them uh, was pretty difficult without also getting into spoilers since they would be jumping around for each one, but uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Any suggestions, let me know. Um, on top of it, talking about Wild Tales, I had actually made a short film in college based on the opening story from Wild Tales. Uh, I was never able to finish it because of personal things that happened uh, with actors who I had at the finale, if you've seen it. Um, but one day I might, I might get it out there. And in fact, a shout out to everybody who helped me on that set because it was one of the best experiences. Um, and they're even working on stuff. So here's a couple of plugs for the stuff that they're working on. Definitely go check out their stuff. They're still making good things. Um, but I'm curious to know your thoughts on any other recommendations. Like I said, I also have a little letterbox uh, list down below in case you want to see some of the other ones that we talked about the live stream. But until next time, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe and keep watching movies.